starting a brand new series today called Happily Even After. Uh, this is our relationship, our love, our marriage series. We do one every single year. Uh, I love doing it. Um, it's funny because you, you rarely do like a relationship series in October, right? We have to do them when we get to February. It's like Church 101. Every pastor in America is doing a relationship series. We're all starting today. We all got on this big conference call and said, okay, it's relationship series time, right? Like, that's just how it goes. We talk about love and relationships in February. Why? Because February is a love month, right? It's the love month. It's Valentine's Day. We love Valentine's Day. I, I got caught watching this overly long documentary this past week just on Valentine's Day. Here's the weird thing. It was not in preparation for today. Uh, I just got caught. Like, I think I've told you enough that I get caught online. So I get caught up watching this uh, Valentine's Day documentary. Do you know where Valentine's Day started? Does anybody know? No? I'm not going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> it's creepy. A lot of sacrifice involved. Um, but February is a love month, right? Something I learned from this documentary, did you know that there are 150 million Valentine's Day cards exchanged every year? 150 million. Can you imagine how much money that costs? I think our kids count for somewhere around 1,000 of those 150. Does anybody, does anybody Valentine's Day coming out their ears? Anybody love Valentine's Day? This is your favorite holiday. Just Kathy. <laughs> One. Favorite holiday, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Mine too. Here's why. I'm really good at it. Like, like every year, Shana's like, man, you have got to be the best husband ever because of how good I am at Valentine's Day. I can say that confidently because she's not in here yet. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She's all. I try. I do my best. We love the thought of love, right? We talk about Valentine's Day. We talk about love. We do relationships here because we love the thought of love. Whether you're in love, you've been in love, you hope to be in love one day, we love the concept of love. We want it in our lives. We want to be a part of it. I took a little heat this past week because we're doing a relationship series and, and not everybody in the room is, is in a relationship. And I'll tell you this, uh, I have struggled with that thought all week long. Here's why I love it, though. Okay, we're talking about love today. The Bible talks about love 310 times. If anyone talks about anything 310 times, we listen, right? If I got up here every single week and I talked about the same thing for the next 310 Sundays, you would either really, really know it and love it, or you'd stop coming to church. Probably the latter. The Bible talks about love 310 times because it values love. So we take a few weeks out of our year and we talk about love. And maybe you're not in a marriage, maybe you're not in a relationship. I promise this applies because the Bible talks about it 310 times. Every word in this book is applicable to our life, right? Whether we are married in a relationship, whether we absolutely hate everyone else, the Bible talks about love and love is important. I read this story this past week that came out of the Philippines in, in May of 2000. I went back a few years. There's this story of this kid who, who uh, started this virus. It was the fastest spreading computer virus in all of history to date. It was called the love bug. Here's why. This kid in the Philippines starts this virus. And within three months, the virus had infected the CIA, the FBI, the State Department, the, the, the British Parliament ended up unplugging computers so that it didn't infect their entire system. It was the fastest spreading virus in history. It was started by this 20-year-old kid who was in college but got kicked out of the computer science program and wanted to prove that he could write a, uh, an effective computer program. And so he wrote this virus. And in this virus, or, or how this virus worked is, is, is he put it in an attachment in an email and then you would get the email and you'd open the attachment and then it would infect your computer and in, in return it would uh, send out the same email to everybody in your email list. Does anybody remember that? It's when we learned that we shouldn't click on things that we don't know what they are. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody just throw caution to the wind and not care about that other than me? I'll click on anything. I will, like pop-ups start happening. I'm like, yeah, just close them out. God knows what's on my computer. People are reading all my stuff. Do you remember when that happened? It's crazy. It's the fastest spreading virus. 
in all of time. And here's why everybody opened it. People should have known better. People that should have known better open this thing. The FBI shouldn't be opening things. But here's what happened is this, this kid started this virus and the attachment was called, I love you. All in caps, all pushed together. It was called, I love you. And because we love this concept of love, this email attachment was, was irresistible to the reader. You get an email and the attachment says, I love you. And it's coming from like, God, know, God knows who on your, on your email list. Old girlfriends, whatever that. And we open it because it's irresistible. Because we love this concept of love. We love love and, and we want to receive love in, in some aspect. We all want love. The weird thing about love is, is that we probably get it wrong more than we get it right. We probably get love wrong more than we get it right. We want to get love, but we don't necessarily know how to get the love that we need. We want to give love, but, but we don't necessarily know how to give the love that they need. A lot of times we have a hard time in our love because we need help desperately in it, and yet uh, we're incapable of asking for help. Whether it's embarrassment or pride that stands in the way, we're, we refuse to seek out help when it comes to the love and the relationships and the marriages. We get it wrong a lot. This past week, I text Shana, as I do pretty much every week, and I say, uh, hey, I need a story on. Like, like I text Shana for uh, illustrations for Sunday morning, and she almost always texts me back and says, I don't know, uh, and then I got to do it myself. So I text her this week, and I say, hey, I need a story about a time when I tried to fix something in the house, and I couldn't do it, so I had to call a professional. I had to seek out this help, right? And she writes me back, and she says, classic, I don't know. And then she says, you can fix anything. And I thought, that is how it's supposed to be, right? Like, wives, that's your response, right? You can fix anything. And I truly believe that I can. I can't, but I believe that I can. I'm a firm believer that YouTube will tell you how to do anything. Will teach you how to do anything. I literally gave a car repair advice to someone last night. I don't know anything about them. But I'm like, yeah, I'll fix that for you. Bring it over. Um, God knows what's going to happen. It all goes down tomorrow. So if any of you mechanics get a call, that's why. I'm going to tinker in someone else's car tomorrow. I'll see what happens. YouTube will show me. If you ever see me under someone's hood with my phone, that's what's happening. So many times in life, we... we we need help, and yet we refuse to go get it. We refuse to seek it out. We, we refuse to, to, to go after or conquer those issues because we think that we're capable of pulling it off, but, but the reality is we're not capable of pulling everything off. And sometimes we need to seek out someone else to help us get through it. Sometimes we need to have somebody else step into our marriage and, and help us fix that marriage. Sometimes we need somebody to help us step into our relationships, our friendships, whatever that might be. Because we think we can pull it off, but that's not always the case. There are ways that we, we, we seek out help. And hopefully your marital uh, strife is not being solved by YouTube videos, but there is always an avenue for help. There is always an avenue to find somebody to help repair or fix what's happening in your relationship. It's okay to need help. It's just not okay to stay in that spot. If you are not working through the issue, then I think that you go backwards. I think that you revert. If you're not moving forwards, you're moving backwards. I truly believe that if we are intentional in our engagement with our mind and our heart, that we begin to move the ball forward in significant ways in every single one of our relationships. Not just our marriage relationships, but every single one of our relationships. Christ called us to, to love all the people around us, right? First John chapter 4 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Why is it important for us to know that love comes from God? It's important because once we start understanding and realizing that, that love comes from God, we begin to realize that God's design for love was set up for us. That there is a design for love that was created for our benefit, for our help, for our strategy. We need to understand that love comes from God because of the detail that he put into it. 310 time detail. That's the detail that he put into it. 
because it's God's design. Here's how he designed it. If you've ever been to a wedding before, you've probably heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love chapter. That's what we call it. And we go to weddings and we hear 1 Corinthians chapter 13 all the time. But it was more than, uh, it was created for more than just a wedding ceremony, more than just a speech at a wedding, more than, you know, your cousin Susan who gets up on the side of the stage and recites this, this passage of scripture. Paul wrote this as like a toolbox for love. It's like when you get a piece of furniture and, and you open up the instructions and the first page always has listed all the things you need to properly execute um, the piece of furniture. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's just me who buys that garbage Ikea stuff. <laughs> oh, my furniture comes complete. Mine doesn't. Mine comes in a very small package and becomes very large. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and it becomes this toolbox for love. It includes everything that we need to properly execute love. It says this. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13 is like this 15-point checklist of all the things that, that need to happen for, for love to happen properly. I think it reads like a checklist for us to execute love properly. I think that we can literally take this passage of Scripture and check them off. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep records. It rejoices in truth. It protects. It trusts. It hopes. It perseveres. It doesn't fail. There's this list of things that happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we have to have. Let's break this down just a little bit further today because no one would deny that this is, that this is an incredible passage of Scripture. It's why believers and unbelievers use it in their weddings. It's why we've heard it before, why we know it before. Maybe you've never heard it, I don't know. But, but it's, it's more than a mere sentiment for, for a wedding. At no point in time do I think that, that, that Paul sat down in this bed of roses and thought to himself, okay, I'm going to write the best wedding speech that humanity has ever seen. This wedding speech is going to transcend time. People are going to use it 2,000 years later. I think that Paul sat down one day and he said, okay, I'm going to write the transcript for what love should look like for all of mankind based on the principles of God, based on what Jesus taught us. All of our lives. I think that Paul wrote this for every single one of us. So as we go through the next few minutes, I want you to take the next five points. And I want you to adequately consider them in the relationships that you have. In the life that you have. Maybe we're talking about the relationship with your sister. I don't know. But, but adequately consider the way that they apply to your life. What I don't want you to do is nudge your husband when you get to a point you think he needs to hear. Okay. But adequately listen to them because I think that Paul wrote this transcript for what we need to look like. This passage is a goal for our life because in chapter 14, one chapter ahead, it says, make love your aim. Make love your aim. The message translation reads it like this. It says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it because it does. Did you hear that? The message. Thank you for your questions. We need to do more of a Q&A type situation in here on Sundays. I don't care. Let's do it. No, don't do it. No hands, please. Here's what it says. Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it. Because it does. I think that we have to note the fact that this is primarily talking about the love that we give, not the love that we get. Go after a love that, that, that our life depends on. Make love your aim. Not just to get it. Go after a life that pushes love out. We all want that kind of love, but, but regardless of what we want, we have very little control over what happens to us in regards to love. With the exception of maybe who we allow to come into our lives. What we do have is the ability to make some decisions in our love 
that reflect Christ, that, that allow God to be a part of it. And maybe when we apply some of his principles, our love gets better. So what's it look like? Let me put this disclaimer out to you. Over the next five points, there are probably things that you have heard. There are probably things that you know. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Maybe they will be new, but, but there's a good chance you will know this. There's a good chance that you have heard this stuff before. The question is not, does your brain know them? The question is, does your heart apply them? Does your heart take these five points that we're getting ready to talk about and use them? The first one is this. If you have your notes, is your first fill in the blank. Be patient with each other's progress. If we want to execute God's principles in our life, we have to be patient with each other's progress, with the people around us' progress. Here's the funny thing about progress. We all have it, right? Hopefully, we are making progress, because like I said, if we're not moving forward, we're moving backward. So if we are not progressing in life, something's wrong. But for the most part, I think that we're all progressing in something. The thing is, is that we're all in a different progression, right? We're all seeking to get somewhere. We're all striving to be at this certain place, but we're all at a different spot in said progression. 200 years ago, Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, when angry, count to 10 before you speak. He said, if very angry, count to 100. And I think people probably thought it was silly and funny because Thomas Jefferson was the funny guy in the group. I'm assuming. It's pure, pure assumption. A hundred years later, okay, look at the progress. Thomas Jefferson says, count to a hundred if you're very angry. Mark Twain, a hundred years later, said, when angry, count to four. He said, if very angry, swear. Okay? Because Mark Twain's the funny guy in the group. I'm assuming because of the mustache. No? <laughs> Just me. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let me talk to the, the, the married people for a second. Your spouse is incredible. Your spouse is wonderful. The person that you are in a relationship with is wonderful. I don't know your background. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, man, no, they are not. <laughs> this is for you. The person that you are in love with is wonderful. Here's why. They have flaws. They are not perfect, and you love them. You have flaws, and they love you. Trust me, your spouse is incredible because you are very flawed. <laughs> I'm assuming. Pure assumption. Your spouse is amazing, not because they are perfect, but because they are flawed. And there is this dynamic in your relationship that works. In verse 4, it says love is patient. Love is seeing people in their mess and loving them before they get it all together. Before they stop doing the thing that annoys you. Before they stop doing the things that annoy you. Would anybody be honest and say, I annoy my spouse probably more than not? <laughs> This past week, I got in trouble because I, uh, I've been on this throw pillow kick, all right? And I'm like, we need to change our throw pillows on our couch. I think that they're stupid. <laughs> and if they don't match, they're stupid. And we have very, very strong opinions on our throw pillows. And I got in trouble because Shana said, I care more about our throw pillows than I should. <laughs> Or than any sh husband should, you know. Like. <laughs> and what's so cool about it is this, this uh, argument that we had over throw pillows literally happened like hours before I had planned on talking to her about getting new throw pillows also in my office. Like, I'm on a throw pillow kick. Um, don't judge our throw pillows when you see them. I had nothing to do with them. <laughs> Shana still loves me despite the fact that I am wildly annoying sometimes. Why? Patience. Pure patience unadulterated patience. The person that you love loves you even though you annoy the junk out of them. <laughs> Hopefully not all the time. But it's seeing someone's faults without it letting it affect your opinion. It's seeing someone's sins and allowing them to, to, to have some freedom in it because potentially God is still working on that. It's loving someone with an understanding that their story is not done that their story is not finished, that God can still work, 
that God is still doing something in their life, that God is still doing something in their heart. Loving them despite their sin, loving them despite their flaws, because their story isn't over. It's not over. Romans chapter 5 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for us by giving us Christ while we were still sinners. Our goal in life is to look like Christ. Feed the poor, be generous, demonstrate love before it's demonstrated back to us. That's the life of Christ. That's the model that was set up for us. When we were wrong, God made it right. When we were wrong, God made it right. Before, before we were right. It's outlandish and it's unfair. It seems absolutely crazy that God would make this massive trade when we don't deserve it. But the Bible calls it love, right? In his love, he gave us Christ when we didn't deserve it. Here's number two. We have to begin to make warmth and affection your personal goal. Make warmth and affection your personal goal. Verse four says love is kind. Kindness is an interpersonal skill. Kindness is an interpersonal skill. A skill is something that we have uh, acquired an expertise at, that we've gotten better at, that maybe we are, we are really, really good at. That's a skill. I don't believe we fall into our skills. I think that our skills are crafted. I think that we have to develop our skills and our skills get better the more we work on them. In this case, they're crafted to be friendly and generous and considerate. Our kindness is associated with gentleness and warmth and concern and care and affection. Titus chapter three says this, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Man, I feel like we can close the book and leave right now. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by grace, we might become heirs, having a hope of eternal life. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appear, he saved us. In his kindness, in his love, he gave us grace and mercy and salvation. In his kindness, in his love, he gave us salvation when we didn't deserve it. He didn't have to do it. He wanted to do it. What do we get out of it? We get out of it the hope of eternal life. We become heirs to the throne, the righteousness of heaven. In all my life, I have never seen kindness kick back in a, in a negative backlash, at least one that, that is lasting. It goes for your marriage, it goes for your relationships, it goes in your workplace, basically transcends into any area of your life that you interact with people. Did you see that? I almost went down. It's happened three times in my life. That was the third time. Oh. <laughs> Sit back here. Don't leave the table. I think in 2019, we need to understand that we need a new wave of kindness more than we have ever needed it before. More than we have ever needed it before. Because we walk out those doors and all of a sudden, kindness seems to dissipate. It kind of disappears. And I think that we need a refresher on what kindness looks like. If your marriage is broken, try kindness. Try it when your spouse is not returning it. Hold their hand more, kiss them more. Say I love you more, clean up around the house for them. Do things for them, give them gifts. Make physical intimacy a priority, not an obligation. Be friends with each other. Go on dates more. Be mindful of the person that you love. That's kindness. 
the return on your investment will revolutionize your relationship. Here's number 13. Or 13. Here's number three. As a matter of fact, here's number three. We become a safe person for our spouse. When we start applying God's principles, we realize that we have to become a safe person for our spouse. Being a safe person is loving them when their guard is down. Being a safe person is being their greatest advocate. Being a safe person is loving them when they fail and bringing them to this point of, uh, of redemption or walking them through this process of life, processing life with them. Verse 7 says it always protects. When we're a safe person emotionally, we ask the good questions. We listen for the answers. So it begs the question, are we a safe person? Are we a safe place for the people that we love? Are we a safe place for, for, for our spouse? Are we a safe place for, for our friends? Or are we defensive? Are we prone to gossip? Do we throw coals on the fire of stress and frustration? Do we contribute to that? We have to get to a place in our relationships of protection. In all of our, in all of our relationships. Sometimes the people that we love are being absolutely ridiculous. Sometimes they are. Here's what I've come to learn. Just because you think that they're being ridiculous doesn't mean that they think they're being ridiculous. And what matters to them matters to them. And if it matters to them, it should matter to you. It clearly matters to them. So Paul's definition of love includes protection. Are you protecting them? Are you protecting what matters to them? Here's number four. I think that allowing a safe emotional environment is developed when we decide each day to believe the best. Verse seven says that love always trusts. Each one of us have expectations. We have dreams in life. We have dreams in love. We have hopes for our relationships. We have hopes for, for our careers, hopes for our families, hope for our kids. Let me get a little motivational speaker on you. I truly believe that we get out of life what we put into it. I truly believe that we get out of love what we put into it. You want the love to reciprocate? Take a step out and do it first. Understand what that love looks like on your end first. Your marriage should be filled with trust. If it's not, then there is a very serious issue in your marriage. You need to seek out help. Our marriages should be filled with trust. But here's what I think happens. I think that we set the bar for trust entirely too low. I think that on a personal, worldly level, the bar of trust is too low. The bar for our relationships is entirely too low. I'll try not to have an affair. I'll try not to look at pornography. I'll try not to, to fight as much. I'll try not to push your buttons. And the bar is way down here, but what if, what if, the bar for our relationships has already been defined. The expectation for our life has already been defined. What if it was dramatically higher? Here's the thing about this biblical trust that was set up in front of us. I think that God is saying, man, do you trust me? Because if you trust me, then you need to trust him. You need to trust her. If you trust me, trust them. This is our bar, not this cares about this bar. This is a stupid bar. It kicks the bar off. This is our bar. And we need to follow God as if God was the bar for our life. He's not calling us to low expectations for our life. Sometimes he's just calling us to different expectations for our life. Because God's plan can be so much different than our plan. God's expectations can be so different than what we think that they should be. He may call you to do some things that are really, really difficult. He may call you to, to let go of some bitterness in, in your relationship with your spouse. He may call you to, to drop some forgiveness on people that you interact with. He may call you to love before it's reciprocated. He may call you to bring God to the forefront of your home, to the forefront of your marriage. If God is not in the forefront of your marriage, that's an issue. If there are issues in your marriage, check and see if God is at the front of it. I promise you, your relationships will be better if God is at the forefront of those relationships, at the forefront of your marriages. When was the last time you let go of your tightly held plan because the Holy Spirit was nudging you in a different direction? When was the last time that you trusted God in this, this new uh, direction for your life? 
Your future is not determined by your past. Your future is determined by how you respond to your past. So take what's there and figure out how to move forward. Figure out the progression. Figure out how to trust the people that you're with. Here's number five. I'm going to close with this. I think that when we begin to apply the principles of God, we look for the God solution to any human problem. There is a solution to every single one of our problems. It was set up for us. It was defined for us. It was gifted to us. Here's the thing about 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is this letter that Paul wrote to a group of people just like you and me. A group of people who attended this church and, and in the middle of their church, they, they started to drift off. It was written to a group of people who let pride get in the way of their love. It was written to a group of people who settled for illicit sex rather than, than physical intimacy. It was written to a group of people drowning in jealousy who began to trivialize their faith. And as a result, this trivialized faith began to affect their relationships, the relationships with the people around them, the relationships that they had with God, with their families. And I would imagine a lot of these people began to give up hope. They begin to settle in on this is just what it is. That there's no redemption, that there's no reconciliation. They gave up on the hope that maybe there's a joyful life. Maybe there's this God-sized solution sitting out in front of them. They gave up. So Paul sits down and he writes this toolbox for love. And he includes verse 7 and 8. He says, love always hopes. It always perseveres and it never fails. Why do we know that love never fails? Because when we have this relationship with Christ, first and foremost, love becomes something entirely different. The love that we know before Christ and the love that we know after Christ is incredibly different. Maybe it's not one that we're used to, but it's one that was designed for us. It's designed by God, and really it comes out of his very nature. Because in John chapter 4, it says God is love. God is love. That's who he is. He embodies it. Every part of his character is love, and he cannot escape it. God cannot separate himself from love. He is love. It's just what he is. It's designed for humanity. Push through the fears, push through the frustrations, and open your heart up to the way that God wants to speak through you and use you in and through your love. Because when we have God, we have love. It's just, it is what it is. Come on, let me pray with you.